Hi, and welcome once again to Unstoppable Mindset. Glad you're here. I really appreciate you coming along with us and joining us every time we do an episode for this journey. Today, we get to meet and work with and talk to Rosalind Panda. And Rosalind is a person who has got a very diverse background, has started a number of companies, has continued to make them successful, is very involved in art. And I'm not going to tell you a whole lot because she will. She knows her (laughs) subject better than I do. So thanks very much for being here. We really appreciate you coming on Unstoppable Mindset. Thank you so much, Michael, for the wonderful warm welcome. I'm glad to be here. Well, why don't we start, as I love to do, and ask that you tell me a little bit about you growing up and so on, where you're from, what you did as as a child, and all those memorable things that we should know about on the podcast. Yeah, absolutely. So, I say so. So, let's start with how I, um, where I'm coming from, right? So, I'm originally from India, and um, uh, until I'm 20, 24, I stayed there. I finished my studies and have visited many places, many cities out there uh, to gain knowledge and having the perspective of having uh, diversity in uh, different states and through different languages, uh, clothing, and the way of just the living, living, right? And then when I am... After 24, I came to United States. I continued my studies here as well in computer science. And after, uh, due to jobs and projects, I moved around cities to cities. And uh, again, continued my journey through gaining experience, um, understanding the diversity, understanding uh, different uh, culture, people, and the people who are coming from different, different countries bringing their wonderful perspective. So that's how I, where I am today. And I'm still learning about humanity and my greatest passion that I love in my um, everyday life is serving humanity because that's my love towards humanity that I learned from life. And I would love to uh, continue that as I go. So when you were growing up in India, you said you visited a lot of cities. Did you visit other places outside of India or just around India? Uh, When I was in India, yes, um, only the cities in different states in India. India. Uh It's it's itself is very big. Also, it is a big compared to (laughs) compared to when things change in in different states. Right away, the language changes, and you feel like you are a foreign uh, in a foreign country altogether. And the food is different, the culture, the language is different, the way the other states are living, that is totally different. So I just uh, went there in different states. I moved around. Yeah, while I was there. When you go from state to state in India, and now you go from state to state in the United States, do you find that there's as much cultural difference between states in the U.S. as there was in India or not so much? Um, I feel as if, um, for example, uh, in uh, uh, last month, I visited to Las Vegas. I went to Arizona. So I see the difference uh, when it comes to the culture, also the, the density of people. For example, in Arizona, there are a lot of people from uh, Mexico. So they're bringing that um spanish culture you will see a lot of like the food is changing a bit and also the weather due to the weather the businesses around that place the food around that place uh it's kind of different but not too much because the language stays still stays the same Mm -hmm. so on only the culture and the uh, food changes but the like because the language stays the same you, I don't feel a lot of difference in there. And also when I went to Dallas, yeah, there is another state I went to Dallas last month as well. It's a bit different. You see the cowboy, um, that culture, right? The, um, uh, that, that is coming. So Southern culture, that is a bit different. The music, the food, 
changes to a certain extent, but not too much. So, but still there is like diversity around, which I enjoy thoroughly. It sounds like differences are a little bit more dramatic in India, especially if language and so on is different from one place to another. Absolutely. Yes, that's true. <laughs> yeah. So you came to the United States and, and you're, you're traveling around. So where do you live? Um, Staten Island, New York. You are in Staten Island. So have you been yeah. to California? Yeah, I was in California for seven years. Since 2004 till 2011, I was in California. I did my what? studies over there and um, I stayed around ample amount of time, like seven years is a lot. Yeah, <laughs> it, is, it is. So where were you in California? I was in uh, Mountain View. Ah. And uh, Fremont and uh, Union Station and also the Bay Area. Quite a, here, quite a few like Bay Area I was there. Um, I enjoyed it as well. Like pretty, pretty close to San Francisco. Yeah. Right. Where did you study? I studied in the Foothill College. It's a college which was nearby my uh, where I was living. Uh, there was uh, Dienza as well, San Jose, which is on those both are coming under San Jose University. So I did some few, uh, like completed my associate's degree over there because I have my bachelor's degree from India. So I come and my postgraduate as well from India. I just wanted to refresh my my um, education, the way of how how people are studying here just went to have some extra knowledge about uh, computer information system, how uh, how how people are adapting to this, the students are learning. And also, I did some really fun classes during my college. For example, swimming. I didn't know swimming before. I was so scared of water. <laughs> so I thought about I thought about overcoming my fear, which is swimming. So I finished my swimming lesson. Now I'm pretty good swimmer <laughs> in three months i launched it i felt so good there are like three few other classes like music class and also i learned taekwondo i did my martial art kickboxing taekwondo and uh, uh california which was so much fun so I enjoyed thoroughly the time i lived there your degrees from india they were in computer science yeah they're in computer science and all computer application uh, system and postgraduate as well in computer application. Did you get a master's degree out of the postgraduate work? Um, I, yeah, it is equivalent to master's degree. Equivalent to so a I master's have, degree, yeah. Yeah. And here you did your AA degree. Did you go beyond that or just get the AA to kind of see how things were and sort of refresh? Just to refresh, exactly. Just to refresh. It's AS degree, uh, yeah. associate in science, yeah. Uh, because I didn't have to uh, do a lot of studies because I had already done those while I was in India. So it is just to, to refresh my memory. There was a gap of, I believe, five to six years between when I finished my studies and here I started. So I just thought about bridging that gap and starting my career fresh here. Yeah. You, you piqued my interest in talking about swimming and being afraid of water. Tell me more about that. How did you overcome it? Or why did you decide to overcome your fear of water and, and get into uh, to being a swimmer? Yeah, so that's a really fun story. Um, when I was a kid, um, during summer vacation, I was when I was in school, during summer vacation, we used to come with my parents to the village, like our village, and there was a pond. Uh, there were many ponds in our village. So normally we go and uh, have bath in the pond in uh, summer. I was so afraid of water and we had a river as well. But I was so, so scared that I wouldn't go too deep into the pond because I think Oh my God, what will be there inside the water? <laughs> you know, there will be rocks and you can see it was pretty deep. So somehow I had a little fear about what is there in the water because I can't see much. Um, and also uh, my mind 
doesn't work when I'm in water. So it was, I was pretty, pretty like I couldn't uh, survive while I was in water. But that, what my dad did it was there was everybody, family member, they were gathered and they were just doing their thing. They were taking bath and having fun. But dad wanted me to swim. So what he did is he just put me into the water and he thought I'm going to just start swimming. I was scared to death. <laughs> I was like, no, dad, I don't know swimming. Not I'm doing putting that. into the water. <laughs> so that didn't help your attitude about water at all, did it? No, not at all. Because he was thinking swimming is pretty intuitive. And as soon as somebody gets into the water, they will just know how to survive by move, making hand or leg movement, which was not pretty intuitive because I, I was not open to that at all. Um, so I heard, I heard that fear in me. And when I'm, uh, so I thought I'm never going to be able to swim <laughs> when it comes to <laughs> water. And when I came to United States in California, when I was staying in a park bent, we had a swimming pool as well. I heard always swimming pools. And I started going to Taekwondo class, the kickboxing class. I used to go to my apartment gym and uh, uh, doing workout every day as well and practice my uh, movements in Taekwondo and learning the things. So while doing those uh, martial arts and kickboxing, I created that resilience and having that full, full determination about overcoming the fear or how practice makes you uh, do and overcome your uh, fear, right? So while when I went to school, I saw the swimming pool. It's a really nice swimming pool. And I saw people are learning swimming. So I thought about how about I also learn swimming and overcome my fear. So there were some extra, I believe, uh, one unit or two unit class it was there for three months so i took it i learned uh i also played tennis that time i did full body flexibility um, class also yoga and music class and apart from that there was a swimming class so i had an instructor i said hey uh, ma'am i am pretty scared of water but i want to really learn and by the time we are done with the swimming class this sentence which is always roaming around my mind that I'm scared of water, it should not be there. In in case, in case there is a situation when I'm inside the water, I should be able to know. Doesn't matter if it is a pond, if it is a river, it is an ocean. Instead of my mind going blackout, <laughs> I should be able to know what to do, at least for a certain period of time, I should be able to survive. I'm not talking about ocean, but still, if I'm in the ocean, I should be able to know how to control my breathing and not totally blank out when I'm uh, uh, in, in the water. So my teacher understood, the instructor understood about it. And he said, I promise that will happen. And you're, you will not be scared of water anymore. Since I was very, very confident. I was fully determined. I at least made sure that when I'm in the water, somebody is watching me and not letting me drown for sure. <laughs> so with that assurance, I just started learning every day with full determination and full dedication. And in a few days, I was so good at it. I was like, I was with, um, with, with the practice and determination. I started doing my freestyle as well as the backstroke. I, would, I was able to float on my back for the whole 50, 50 meter uh, swimming pool. And it was, I was ecstatic. I was so happy that there is nothing in my life anymore that I can say I'm scared of. Because that was the only thing, the water, which was a practical thing. <laughs> what, is, what is interesting, though, is that you made the choice not to be afraid and you uh, whether you totally did it with intent, you you created an environment where you could eliminate the fear. You told your instructor about it, and your instructor then helped. But 
You made the choice not to be afraid. We did an episode earlier this year. It was actually on April 13th. It was our 29th show. We interviewed a gentleman named Matt Rock. And Matt swims every day or every other day in the Pacific Ocean off of Dana Point in Southern California. And he talks about his fear, not of swimming, but when he first decided to try to swim in the winter when it was much colder water, like 55 degrees Fahrenheit in the water. And Matt doesn't use a wetsuit. And he talked about being afraid and again, made the decision, although it was a little bit scary, but he made the decision to jump in the water when he got really close to it. And then within a couple of seconds, he was used to the water and everything was fine. But again, it's a choice. And when he found out that there was really no great reason to be afraid of the water simply because it was cold or for you, you made a decision not to be afraid of the water just because you go in the water and you can sink and bring yourself up and so on. That's really what it's all about, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. Because I believe that our mind is everything. And uh, when we decide something in our mind, the mind doesn't control us anymore. But it it learns it less listens to us like okay, uh, she wants to do it and I don't have any control or fear in it, but rather I should just cooperate, right? So that's what happens when your intention, your determination overpowers your mind because mind can play so many games of fears and uh, make you scared of anything which does not even exist. So I believe in that, and uh, yeah, here I am. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So you have done a lot of studying and you've learned a lot. What did you do with all that knowledge? And did you work while you were studying, like when you came to the U.S., or did you just study? Or tell us a little bit more about kind of when you got here and went to school and what all you did. Yeah. So uh, when I went to my school college, right, in uh, Portal College in uh, California, I was, I was, uh, I would say that I was very fascinated by all the classes and the teachers. I had really good teachers. They were, they were coming from uh, different countries like uh, England and uh, uh, Europe, uh, Australia, so it was a fun college because we, in our college, there were, I, I believe there are more than 70 countries uh, the students are coming from. So I saw a beautiful acceptance, a beautiful acceptance in everybody and encouragement, which was extremely fun for me because I had friends from Mongolia, my best friend, one of my best friend from Brazil from India, from United States. So I made really wonderful friends who were very kind and fun loving. And they were approaching me and said, Rosalind, will you be our my best friend? So that's how they were so much fun. So it was cool to to experience that from from a simple, you know, innocence that we have as human beings when somebody comes and opens up uh, towards you and uh, helps you throughout their journey and makes it even more fun and adventurous. So while I was in um, school, um, I was also helping my fellow uh, uh, other students uh, learning. So they were struggling in math and uh, a few other classes, English. Yes. So to write their essays or help them understand, there were a few classes which was called like critical thinking and writing. So we had to analyze some movies, write what we our analysis about the movie. And it was pretty, pretty cool how the teacher were giving those assignments. And it was helping us think through and express ourselves. So I was helping my friends who were coming from different uh, countries and they were not uh, pretty fluent in uh, English and thinking through and expressing themselves. So I was helping them express. I, I was helping them making sure that they were also doing their excellent, their best. Um, you know, so math, 
and english i was helping others to do as well and uh, also while doing the swimming class also one person was totally scared of swimming she i think she was about she was uh, she gave up in 3 days she said no i cannot do this i am i am losing my <laughs> i'm losing my patience with this i'm so scared of water and i cannot do this she was about to give up i kept telling her now just 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 be patient and uh go through the process trust the process there is this instructor she is not letting you drown at all so and i am here also i was well, because we both were swimming so when she was feeling like she was drowning i was getting her her up so that was pretty fun that while it it gave a wonderful lesson in my life as well while you do your part you can help others uh, survive and do their best as well did so you tell we her that you were afraid of water yeah we started okay. at the same point she ah. clearly knows that <laughs> that i was so scared of water but in third day i started having my confidence in myself but she was giving up but then i kept her going and she by the time we finished she was at a point that she was not afraid of any water anymore but she she needed more practice she was a little weak so she was not that strong determined or uh, strong willed so but i don't know what happened after that but at least she survived through that time so those were fun times that we really had also the food um there were some 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 events in our school that was happening around every year where all the uh, every cuisine right some somebody is coming from fiji somebody is coming from china thailand korean indian american uh, brazilian all the food everybody was specializing in and they will get some food their authentic food and we will have in the event those food displayed and we will go to every uh, stall one by one and try those food and experience that even if we are not going to the uh, country by ourselves in person but by having the food and talking to them and how it's made how, what are the ingredients to interact with those people who are coming from those countries it was it was excellent to accept everybody and learn everybody's culture and you know to feel more human not just live in your own bubble so it was it was excellent experience while i was in school always so, memorable so were you, when you were in school did you work or did how did you support going to school and all that so yeah i was working i was uh, uh doing my computer science uh, some of the projects as well i was tutoring some kids who were preparing for uh math uh competitive exam so i was really uh, putting a lot of effort into helping others like kids who were learning math and uh, computer science projects also i was doing um i was a math instructor in my school as well um helping others through uh in their their classes which when they are struggling so that those all those projects i did when i was uh, at school so you were at school and you finally got your associate of science degree then what did you do i moved from there to different states cities so i started getting projects in different cities like boston i came uh, on a project and uh, after that project was finished i moved to other cities like milwaukee wisconsin uh, washington and austin texas a lot of projects i did in different cities so i have moved around i believe uh seven to eight cities after my schooling yeah well how did people learn about you that they asked you to come and deal with different projects and so on um believe it say when you get a software or uh, software um, development degree and you have the platforms like dice career builder monster and you're looking for good projects and depending on what skill sets you have and so we, i was approached uh, with a lot of project 
till now as well if, if you learn a good skill set and you keep like adapting i was keep i was uh, always adapting to new technologies um starting from uh, web 2 uh, 1.0 where we are just dealing with static websites but as in my era uh, already 2.0 was introduced so i was fully learning the new frameworks the uh, the all the software uh, like what do you call libraries that we are going to be using with that web application development software development so i was getting those projects based on my skill sets which were totally in demand and a lot of big companies fortune 500 companies they wanted good uh, skilled and people and also i'm very uh, proactive about uh, uh moving on and having a good career learning good things and helping clients helping the organization do well in whatever projects they are trying to do so it just kept kept me moving when you were doing um a lot of that coding and and dealing with people helping them create whether web applications or websites did you ever get involved much with accessibility and dealing with making websites available for persons with disabilities uh, absolutely uh, because a lot of our applications when uh, they are fully mature and we are uh, using the advanced technology for billions of users to use at a time uh, we are depending on for enhancing the security scalability the user friendly usability and accessibility because the more and more people are using uh, technology every genre every uh, from every category of people started using it so once the application is mature accessibility was a pretty heavy department that um, everybody was stressing on so i was involved in uh making accessible like healthcare projects uh as well as uh banking applications some of the uh insurance applications which um the accessible uh disabled people are using so we we definitely I was involved in those projects as well if i understand what you're describing you're saying that the applications would would be created and then other things were accomplished such as making the applications accessible or did accessibility start right from the outset of the application the accessibility was um, also parallelly being done while the application is already being used uh, we had to use certain libraries and certain code standards uh, w3c standards uh, there are certain libraries to use so that the screen reader can read those uh, html code or all the uh, what do you call it, the web the languages uh, for the screen reader so as as html5 became more semantic uh, so we wanted to um, on top of that to make the applications accessible we are implementing the libraries to make it so yeah. why is it that we see so many websites today and also a lot of applications that are still not at all accessible there there's so many examples one can find both with websites and just a variety of applications i mean even voting although voting electronically isn't totally accepted anyway but why is it that we find a lot of resistance or a lot of lack of attention to making accessibility an integral part of all of that and now uh, the organizations uh, it's it depend on the culture and the budget they allocate for every project they maybe they are not stressing on uh, making it accessible uh, because every application that uh, is built a lot of uh, it goes through always user ex, uh, testing right user ex, um, acceptance testing there is a certain number of people uh they would do the testing in production environment and they constantly get user input from their real time user their customers to make the application even better where the users are facing challenges they imp implement uh more creative design thinking towards what they what they develop 
but it depends always on the organization if they're stressing on considering those points and thinking about the category of people who really want to use the application but due to it is not accessible they have to take other people's help rather than being self sufficient to use the application i believe that's a drawback in the organization if they are not using those and making it accessible for uh, those uh, customers because that's very very important to do so part of, the, part of the problem it seems to me also is that if we would make accessibility a part of the native development and make it so that you can't create without including access that would help but for example the people who make tools that people use to create websites don't have anything in those tools that mandate accessibility even though it's pretty well defined today for example with the internet Uh, web content accessibility guidelines 2.1 soon to be 3.0 and so on but the people who create the tools that build websites don't have any specific requirement within the tools that says not publishing the website till it's fully accessible and conforms with the guidelines yeah so n- native access doesn't happen yeah no i i agree uh because the frameworks that are being implemented uh they they focus on internationalization but accessibility is totally a sort of different uh libraries and standard all together that the framework don't consider having that but i believe it's a very 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 crucial part essential part to have this included as well so that nobody can um neglect or ignore those scenarios as well but it's it should be a essential part to be considered while making the application for normal user as well as uh, ready for the accessible uh, disabled people as well yeah let's basically the way to probably say it best is accessibility or what i prefer to say is inclusion should be part mm-hmm. of the cost of doing business and it just isn't yet for everyone yeah absolutely but i i believe that there is certain challenges as well because even if you try to make application accessible and using those library and standard there will be certain areas which need uh i believe a lot more um expertise i would say but i believe a lot of organizations are facing uh challenges while doing it uh cuz even if we try to make it fully accessible but every applications functionality their behavior is different so sometimes the uh, application become extremely complicated or a complex where they think no we don't want to make it accessible because it's not it's not that simple for somebody the screen reader to read everything it might not be so i i believe in future those challenges should be overcome and we should be thinking about uh, from a solution oriented approach and inclusion as you mentioned then those challenges will be overcome uh, day by day what i a think. lot of the challenges are more perceived than actual though and i think that that's the yeah. issue is that people think things are perhaps harder than they need to be but mm-hmm. it is a process and um and hopefully we'll also find more schools include teaching about access and teaching people to make access and inclusion part of what they do as they are students so that they will then go out and automatically do it when they graduate and go out into the world as uh, as workers yeah uh, yeah absolutely um as you said human being are very intelligent they have they are given the brain right to think and find a solution and with that specific determination and approach if we think through and try to find that solution then we can definitely find find uh, go somewhere be, you know, instead of just giving up and thinking about no it's pretty difficult we don't want to do this and those organizations every organization i believe they should allocate um and uh, the project to make their application accessible that will that will be like icing on the cake you're making your application accessible to everyone 
which is absolutely wonderful you know that's uh, um, we'll truly appreciate that that kind of approach from organizations yeah. well tell me more about you you um so you went to work and along the way, you became certainly a thought leader, a technology innovator, and you went into art. Um, tell me about that, if you would. Absolutely, yeah. So I would start with my, my childhood time when we are born with, I believe we are all born with creativity as a tool inside us. The challenge becomes when we don't identify it, right? We just think, oh, we are not artistic. So I believe, and then we start comparing with each other and not nurturing that inside us, which is opposite in my case, because I have been brought up in a very encouraging uh, family. My parents, my dad and mom, they are extremely encouraging and they, they could recognize, they could identify that when we give, when we create that environment for a, for our children, then, and also make them understand what they can do with their time, what they can do with their brain, their developing brain, their focus, their concentration. Then, uh, uh, so I was, I was heavily uh, encouraged through, uh, throughout my childhood. I was learning, I was studying in a school also where the environment was extremely encouraging and they were focusing on extracurricular activities. For example, focusing on uh, nurturing your creativity, writing poems, uh, learning music, uh, using your time to express on um, certain mediums like pencils, sketches, drawings, paintings, and also uh, game. We were playing games. Uh, outside outdoor activities and uh, acting um, uh, <laughs> acting also I was uh, pretty pr pretty much open to every form of creativity a human being can do and uh, uh, while uh, after school when I come from uh, in, in my house I, I, I love to paint that time because that that is the time I can uh, express myself it's a my calm calm time right we express we think about it and i love colors so i love to see what i'm creating so i i play outside as well and i have to come back i create and i uh that gives me a balance throughout the day before i do my homework i also learn music i create music i give lyrics and music and i play harmonium as well and write poems as well, I, I sing in front of the whole crowd, my village, my school, and the whole city. So this is all part of my creativity, and art is one of them, which I always nurtured it to the max. I was uh, <clears throat> participating in many drawing competitions, painting exhibitions as well. Well, I was in school. Um, my my school, my teachers, and my parents were. Um, having me to were giving me those platforms and telling me that no we will create that platform for you Rosalind where you can uh, excel and uh, uh, make us proud you know it's not it's just a as a kid we can understand as oh yeah I'm making your school proud or your parents proud but uh, but really essentially you're truly getting yourself up you're getting your your own inner creator uh, encouraged more and more so that it becomes a habit when we uh, land into our adulthood. So that's what happened. I carried out all my habits, what I was doing since my childhood uh, to my adulthood as well. And as soon as I could afford <laughs> my canvases, my colors, my oil colors and my time, I just became like professionally, I cre started creating since last, like, I believe, uh, more than four, around 14 years or so, I have been creating them professionally. And I loved uh, the oil medium, oil colors on canvas the best so far. 
um, because I the oil color, the expression, the textures that comes out, it's out of the world for me. So I believe I can express in those, but I can also do through pencil, sketches, watercolor, acrylic, uh, sketch, anything you give me, I can create those. But oil color is the best one that I do as of now. And when I'm creating art, my purpose behind why I'm creating, there is a bigger purpose behind it. Um, I believe the underlying message that I put in all my paintings are love towards humanity, inner peace, world peace, optimism, and positivity. I believe those are really crucial and uh, foundational principles in um, human life. Those elements, we those are indispensable in human life. So I put those in my paintings. I also write poems around them so that people can really, because words are food to the soul. So I always believe if I'm creating something wonderful, it's we are feasting our eyes, but also we are feeding our soul. We are feeding our, we ex, I am expressing my heart and soul when I'm creating but it's 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 emitting such a wonderful energy to the viewer or the reader through my poems when they're reading it and connecting uh, my feelings, which I'm expressing through the poems and on canvas. So it's a beautiful way of expression and, and um, uh, consumption and also intake for the viewer. And so is that so, is that your work today or well? What what do you do for work and how does all that fit into it? I I do um, work wise. I'm a professional artist, and as well as I I'm a business owner where I help clients with software development with any technology, every technology, Web 2.0. As well as I do crypto. I'm the founder of the world's first utility based crypto ecosystem, Rover Token. So building those applications as well for to serve the mankind. So I'm fully a technology person and I believe in innovation. So that's where all my time and energy also go. I help uh, so many clients as well uh, throughout my day in their web application development as well. Yeah. So you do a lot of web development and web work and so on. Is that kind of where you focus most of your time or what do you do most of? I do, as I mentioned, like software development, I do the most and also art. Uh, it's kind of 60, 40, 60 software and then 40, 30 is all the creative um, things about it. Technology also, I put my creativity and when we're building, I'm thinking about the creative ways to coming up with a solution to uh, the client's uh, challenges that are facing. So a new implementation, any defects that are arising in the applications, I focus on those, as well as creating art and writing poems for people. And also I have construction business, Rosalind Constructions is another business I, that I also handle. And uh, Aruba Token, which is, as I mentioned, that is the world's first crypto-based ecosystem. I also put my time into creating those as well. So what what is Rosalind Panda Construction all about? Uh, Rosalind Construction Company is all about uh, steel detailing, um, architectural designing, interior designing. Uh, so those are the aspects of uh, Rosalind Construction. So it's, still, it's still growing, designing. it's expanding. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. So you you're doing this. You're mainly in the designing part of construction, which again gets back to creativity, doesn't it? Exactly, exactly. All my businesses are revolving around creativity. I I just love being creative in all my areas. Yeah. So you use CAD systems, I believe, and would expect in your construction work. Yeah, we have we have uh, certain uh, like certified people as well. It's not like I am doing directly, right? So I, I am the CEO. I have my team as well who take care of those. They use certain tools and uh, to uh, to take care of those specific elements like steel detailing and construction business. It's expanding. I'm, uh, my team is also growing. So, 
there are a lot more to come in future. Yeah. I started a company back in 1985 when I needed to because I couldn't find a job. And we sold some of the first PC-based CAD systems. So we used AutoCAD and another one called VersaCAD, although AutoCAD has become the most famous one and the most widely known, I think, in the in the CAD world. And we had some other CAD systems, but it was right at the beginning of when people started to recognize that CAD actually could allow someone to be just as creative, do it in a fraction of the time, and still then go on and do more work and get more jobs and hopefully make more money and support their business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. <laughs> yeah, CAD does not stifle or limit your creativity. It gives you another way and sure. in a, in a lot of ways, a more effective way to 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 show it. Yeah, exactly. You can customize it. You can now uh, use your creativity and uh, build what you want on top of it. Just a uh, basic tool that you can uh, definitely incorporate your creativity to do so. Yeah. Right. So you're doing a, a lot of different things, needless to say. And um does does there ever happen to be a, a spillover or do things get combined together? You're doing artwork and, and in any way, does that get to spill over into your other companies and so on? Or are they really separate? Um, I believe, as I said, that it's a common element where my creativity flows, right? It all my all my businesses are revolving around creativity. I also write books. I, I have my latest book. I co-authored a book called Powerful Female Immigrant, about 24 uh, powerful immigrant uh, uh, women who are uh, making a difference uh, uh, despite of the surmountable odds they have faced in life. And there is another book just got launched, which is called Let Self Become the Leader, which is by me, which is uh, 10 foundational principles to lead your life. So that's the book just got launched last week on 12th November. So that is be pretty like um, it will be available in few days in Amazon. It's already in the process. And um, I also speak. I'm a speaker as well. I speak on public uh, platform stages, uh, podcasts. Uh, so I believe it's not a spillover. But it's it's a different angle of my my personality. What makes me as a wholesome, and I believe in holistic um, uh, fulfillment as a human being, uh, rather than just being um, being one directional. I I become diverse. I I let my uh, imagination I uh, flow into different angles of me and making me who I am. It's part of my personality. I let it flow. I unleash my imagination, my creativity. It, when it tries to flow on the canvas, I do through art. When I'm trying to do through words, I write poems and write book. And when I'm trying to express through my words, I speak on stages and help others, empowering others, inspiring them and so that they can do and they can be inspired and empowered to do what they love to do. They can be more of what they want to be. And uh, while in doing the software development, I let my creativity, my solution-oriented mind, my creative design thinking to in the uh, development of the dev of applications so that because I know that the main purpose of letting my creative into different directions is to serve humanity. The intention behind what I do is to serve humanity. So it's going to serve so many users, so many customers at the end that it gives me that pleasure and that driving force to do so. I'm not just coming up with a solution to do for myself. Uh, that's of, of course, it's serving me because I'm nourishing my passion, my intentions, my uh, my day-to-day -day activities for sure but the end goal the intention behind it is about about the people about the humanity what we are helping what i'm helping 
through my creativity. So I let it How do you, how do you, as you're being creative, keep from getting a mental block that blocks being creative? How do you keep going? You know, writers <laughs> oftentimes talk about getting writer's block and they can't move forward and and so on. You sound like that doesn't happen to you. Why is that? Why is that? Because, uh, as I mentioned, when we become unidirectional and just go in one direction, sometimes we feel stuck because we're not thinking around the edges. And that time we can take a small break and come up, come up with a fresh mind to move on. Because remember, when uh, to get a momentum in any of our actions, sometimes we need to take two steps backward and to come forward with a greater force or a full momentum, uh, like the trampoline effect. If you want to jump higher, you you know that you have to go down in the trampoline to <laughs> to little uh, beneath, like little below the surface as well. So that's how uh, the mental block happens when we think as if we are really stuck. But if we change our perspective and give us a small break about thinking, oh, okay, I'm not able to come up with the idea right now. How about uh, just let me take a walk or let me just get away go go away from this thing what i'm trying to do in few minutes i'll be coming back with a fresh mind and it it comes it really comes so that's that's when we have to have our patience with ourselves to to have understanding about how creativity really flows we have to have that understanding so so many people call it procrastination but it is not really procrastination. If you know the story of Leonardo da Vinci or the artists who were in the history, they used to do so many things at a time and they would be coming back to what they're creating a project. If they're not really procrastinating, it's rather they, and they know that if they're working on a big project or something, then sometimes the mind has to think from a perspective as totally external uh, a person, not the person who is creating, rather a person who is reading. So we have to switch our paradigm, switch our perspective. Then only the block which gets created in the mind that that goes away. For example, yes. if I mm -hmm, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. So for example, a chef, right? If a, when a chef is cooking and when he's cooking, he's going to appreciate his food. He's going to be like, oh, this is tasty because he's creating it. But if he changes his perspective and thinks about from a, a uh, from a customer point of view or the person who is eating, then he, he will be giving a better feedback on that. He can think, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. My, I might need to improve this food a little bit because... When I'm thinking about it like a creator, I am appreciating everything, but I'm not thinking from the user perspective, the 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 person who is eating. So that's how switching the perspective changes the game for me all, and the people who are having the block blockage in their mind as well. It's all about letting your inner mind take over and not stressing about it. And that's what I thought you would say, and that's really what it's all about, is mm -hmm. the blocks are things that we create ourselves. So you have written and you exemplify leadership in a lot of ways. What to you is true leadership and how do you implement it? I believe that true leadership starts with leading yourself first. Before even leading others, first, if we as a human being, if we can lead ourselves the best and uh, thinking about having perseverance, patience, persistence, endurance, and having a uh, schedule, a discipline, how to, how to let our inner creator uh, think and uh, lead ourselves the best. I believe that's the true leadership because if a person, when a person they know how to lead themselves, Despite all the chaos, all the stress, all the 
negative environment that can impact their mind state uh when they can control they can control or have a wonderful balance in their mind that time they they impact others who are in the surrounding or uh, and eventually their uh, uh, the world they create a wonderful ripple ripple effect in their own consciousness which is self consciousness and when they and afterwards they impact their community where they are serving in their day to day life and in the world because everything their true leadership reflects through their actions their words their uh, what they are doing in their activities their intentions so i believe leading yourself leading ourselves first as a human being that's true leadership it doesn't matter what role you have what authority you have what designation you have uh, but having that mind state uh, to to be happy to be content to be uh, to be the own driving force in your own life uh, is very crucial how do you want people to remember you 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 interact with a lot of people and then you go on and do other things and so on what what do you want people to remember about you and what kind of effect do you want to have on the world yeah that's a wonderful question so when when i want people to remember me i believe they would remember me as an artist who uh, loved to express herself on the canvas or no matter what medium i'm writing book or speaking or writing this you remember is me as a creator who unleashes its own power to create create that ripple effect to impact other people's lives i empower others i inspire others to be their best excel and improve in their lives and as a good leader who knows how to lead myself uh, first in my life and impacting others as well and empowering others with optimistic approach with a positive approach and just a positive person a optimistic person a true leader you know who serves yeah. the humanity serves the community and believes in giving back to the community through every action that's what i want an innovator technology innovator uh, a futuristic a visionary a thought leader a change maker who who brings wonderful huge difference into uh, her life which is me and also every every person surrounding me eventually the world so let me ask you this question <clears throat> we call this the unstoppable mindset podcast what does unstoppable mindset mean to you and what advice do you have for people listening to our episode today uh, unstoppable means no matter what happens in your life what circumstance or oh, you go through nobody can break your spirit you are the person who is leading yourself throughout every situation and you as a human being you totally understand the journey of life right we are all doing a journey we are all experiencing a journey from starting a uh, point a to z which is from birth to until we breathe the last on earth um unstoppable means you don't stop at any point no external factor no external circumstance can break your spirit no matter what you go through everything is an experience when the experience is leaves a bitter taste in your mouth you're learning a lesson and grow through it evolve through it but never stop or never get stuck you are more than your mind right you more you more than your mind because the mind is going to play all the games and all the uh, voices it will start uh, talking to you to stop you from doing something to stop you from uh, be the leader in your own life but unstoppable means you are more than your mind you are controlling your mind 
you are the master you are the captain of your own ship of life so that's what unstoppable means and the biggest lesson there is that it really is your choice and you don't need to let different kinds of circumstances stop your spirit you may not have control over everything that happens to you but you always have control over how you mentally deal with it yeah absolutely absolutely because as human being we all go through so many unwanted circumstances nobody is just uh, uh uh playing on a better process right life is a journey filled with a uh, bitter taste bitter experience wonderful experience happy sad experiences but all that matters is we don't change we don't become a negative person after any experience we don't just generalize our experiences or people or what we see or experience on earth because every every person is different every person is unique every experience is unique uh, so we have to grow through it no matter what we go through we spread the wonderful fragrance in the end we understand that life is filled with wonderful experiences we stay optimistic and positive and emit the wonderful energy into the world Well, Rosalind Panda, this has been wonderful. If people want to reach out to you, learn more about what you do, maybe engage your services or learn about your books and so on, how do they do that? Uh, absolutely. Uh so my website is uh, rosalindpanda.com. Uh, That's Could my website. Could you spell website. that, please? Yeah, absolutely. R O S A L I N D and my last name is panda p a n d a .com rosalindpanda.com is my website where uh, my socials are also there everything is linked to my website i have my rosalindarts.com which lists out all my paintings people can read about it and rosalinditservices.com is we are where we help clients with their uh web it uh, all the web uh, technology related needs and requirements and uh, uh rosalind construction um is also where we help clients with their construction businesses rova token is the cost utility based crypto ecosystem all these businesses are all aligned and uh, mentioned inside the rosalindpanda.com website all integrated with uh the my all, all other websites in facebook i am known by rosalind uh panda you can search me uh and also connect with me on uh, i'm also in linkedin rosalind panda and uh, on instagram i am rosalind panda 5 uh the number 5 rosalind panda 5 and on twitter it is my handle is rosa jubilee uh which is r o s a j u b l e e that's my twitter handle and also i'm on tiktok which is rosalind panda 1 so yeah so i'm all on the social media as well people can connect with me and work with me i will, i'm lo- i would love to help others i hope people will do that and uh, we definitely will stay in touch as well So thank you for being here and thank you for listening. I hope that you've enjoyed this. I hope that you've learned from it. I have and I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with Rosalind but also to make this podcast something for all of us to listen to and grow from. If you'd like to comment on today's podcast, please feel free to email me at michael h i at accessibi a c c e s s i b e dot com or go to my podcast page michaelhingson dot com slash podcast and please wherever you're listening to this give us a five star rating we do appreciate your ratings and your comments very well so once again rosalind thank you very much for being here and we look forward to hearing more from you and about you in the future and, and definitely let us know any way we can help Thank you so much Michael I thoroughly enjoyed it it was a pleasure and looking forward to many more